Hey guys, good day and thanks for coming back to the next video. Guys, I want to revisit a topic I did probably, um, you could search my videos for a rider on a white horse, uh, I guess about six months or a year ago, but I want to revisit this topic and um, there's been some new insight into this for me and uh, let's jump to, uh, this is the first seal of Revelation, there's the rider on a white horse who has a crown and he's been getting, he has a bow um, and he comes to conquer, that's what we hear. Let me go to my document I have here. So let's look again at Revelation 6, uh, starting at verse 1. It says, Now I watched the, when the Lamb opened the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice, Come, and I looked, and behold, a white horse. And its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering to conquer. So, Many people think that this is the Antichrist coming to rule the world or, or conquer the world, I guess. And we can get to that in a second. Uh, but let's, let's ask the question, where are his arrows and who is he coming to conquer? So when we go to uh, the second seal, we see it says, And I see the second living creature say, Come, and now out, out came another horse, bright red, and its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people would slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So the second seal, we see that war is coming to the earth. This rider on a horse that's coming out of heaven, is what it would appear. And the second seal, like I said, is war coming to the earth. Then the third seal goes like this. It's a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard what seemed like a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat, for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, do not harm the oil and the wine. This would appear to be famine coming to the earth. And then the fourth rider is on a pale horse, and we learn something that's different about this fourth rider. He has a name, death. And Hades, the place of the dead, like hell, is following belong, behind him. And they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with a sword and with famine and pestilence. So here we have massive death coming to the earth. The fifth seal speaks of the folks that are that have long passed away, that have passed away, the fellow servants, and they're under the altar, and they are giving this robe, which would signify some type of new body, and these guys are in heaven waiting. Then of course we have the sixth seal, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I want to go and I want to um I want to play a short little video, guys. Hang out with me on this one. This is Derek Prince. He's a, a well-known uh, preacher. Let's see what he has to say. Now we come to chapter 6. And I will simply give you the Prince version. You don't have to believe it, but I believe that God has made this real to me. First of all, there are the four horsemen. We read about each of them. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 6. Now when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures say with a loud voice, like thunder, Come. And I want to point out to you right at the beginning that every one of these horsemen were commanded from heaven. They're not the result of things that happened on earth. The initiative came from God. You need to know that. And I looked and behold a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. That's not a royal crown, but the, the wreath of a conqueror in the games, like the gold medal in today's Olympic Games. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, a lot depends on how you identify that white horse. But I'll say personally for me, over the years, it has become so vivid that the white horse is Jesus Christ riding out through the gospel to all the earth. Okay, so he clearly says he feels the Lord has shown him that this rider on a white horse at seal number one is Jesus himself. Um, so that's the premise of this study. So before we get too far along, let's, let's remind ourselves on a few other things because um, this can be kind of confusing. So let's let's look at the first beast of Revelation. So in Revelation chapter 13, uh, Paul, the Apostle John describes this first beast. 
and he says this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you all are very familiar with this. One of its heads, that would be the man of lawlessness, seemed to have a mortal head wound, a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed after the beast. And we commonly think this beast is the man of lawlessness or the Antichrist. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. So the dragon would be Satan. They worshipped Satan, for Satan had given the authority to this beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against the beast? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and it was allowed and he was allowed to ex and it I'm sorry it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months so the beast rules the world for three and a half years then I saw a second beast another beast rising up from the earth it had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon it exercises all the authority of the first beast and its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal head wound was healed. So at some point, this first beast, the Antichrist, is killed. And we learn in Revelation verse uh, 6, uh, 13, verse 6, it goes like this. It says uh, that the first beast was wounded by the sword and yet lived. So we know that he was killed, it says it up here, and that he was wounded by the sword, and he somehow came back to life. And somehow that coming back to life and was healed is what is what allows the whole world to marvel after him. It's the fact that he resurrected from the dead is what brings people, sort of like how we worship Jesus in a way, to worship this beast who is the instead of or the Antichrist. And we learn from Revelation chapter 1 verse 16 that Jesus, his mouth, coming out of his mouth, is a sharp sword. So if reading Revelation chapter 13, verse 14, we can see that a sword is what kills the beast, and Jesus' is what comes out of his mouth is a two-edged sword. So we'll see evidence of this a little bit later. Okay, so the beast is killed, and the whole world marvels after him after he is resurrected from the dead. So when does that occur? Okay, so the first prophecy in the Bible speaks about this offspring of the woman bruising the head of the offspring of Satan. You see that right there. He shall bruise your head. Isaiah 14 speaks about the Assyrian. Now the Assyrian is another name for the Antichrist in the Old Testament. So let's, let's go ahead and read what it says in Isaiah 14. Um, and that I will break the Assyrian in my land, the land of Israel, and on the mountains will trample him underfoot, and his yoke shall depart from them, and his burden from off their shoulder. Okay. Um, Isaiah 31. Turn to the Lord of hosts, from whom the people have deeply revolted. So people have revolted literally against Jesus. O children of Israel. Remember the children of Israel, more numerous than the sand of the sea. That doesn't sound too Jewish, since the Jews are only about, uh, what, 12 million, while the Christians are 3 billion. For in that day, everyone shall cast his idols of silver and gold, which your hands have sinfully made for you. And the Assyrian shall fall by the sword, but not of man. And a sword, not of man, shall devour him. And he, the Assyrian, shall flee from the sword. So we learn that this is Assyrian, just like it says up here in Revelation chapter 13, verse 14, is wounded by the sword. So the beast is wounded by the sword, and the breath, we'll learn about that in a second. And then what comes out of the mouth of Jesus is this sword that does wound him. And in Isaiah 31, we learn that this Assyrian falls by the sword, which is not of a human. So we can see that there is a connection between Isaiah 31, verse 6, and Revelation 13, verse 14. We see the same thing in Isaiah 27. It says, And in that day, with his hard and great and strong sword, this sword, in that day the Lord, with his hard and great and strong sword, will punish Leviathan, that fleeing serpent that is of the sea. We know that in Revelation 13, the beast comes up out of the sea. So here we have another reference to the Antichrist, Leviathan, who's fleeing, which is the same reference we see in Isaiah 31, where the sword kills this Assyrian, which we would say is the Antichrist. 
Okay, and look what happens in Isaiah 27. Now, Isaiah 27 is right before Isaiah 28, which is the asteroid hitting. Now, does that mean this occurs before the asteroid hits? It might. Let's continue to read. So, when the when the strong sword, the breath of Jesus, and we'll see about see that in Second Thessalonians 2, kills this fleeing serpent. Look what it says. It says, and you will be gleaned, harvested one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of the Assyrian, and those who were driven out of the land of Egypt, shall come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Now this is hard to see, but this would be to me, this is the holy mountain of the new city, Jerusalem. This is a rapture of people taken to the heavenly Mount Zion. You can read about that in Hebrews 12. We see, we see in Revelation 12 that E, uh, that uh, Jerusalem, that great city, is actually referred to symbolically as Sodom, where the Lord was crucified. The reason I bring this up is I want to emphasize the point that in Isaiah 27, this can't not be the earthly city, Jerusalem. Because here in Revelation 8, at the time that the day of the Lord is occurring and all this stuff's going on, Jerusalem is referred to as Sodom, which surely is not a holy city, holy mountain, which we, I would say is the new city, Jerusalem in heaven. Okay, let's continue on about the man of lawlessness. So we have again, as it says in Isaiah 27, that when the Lord this, with his sword kills this fleeing serpent, we see the same reference to, um, and then gathering occurring, this gleaning occurring from Isaiah 27. We see the same thing in the New Testament book of 2 Thessalonians 2. It says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together to him, and that would be the rapture or some event where he comes and gathers up his faithful, okay? He says, To the effect that that day of the gathering, the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day of the gathering will not come unless the rebellion, the apostasy, the falling away, the accepting of the fallen angels as our gods is what I think it is, comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Okay? And it goes on to say this. It says, And you know what is restraining him now so that he may not be revealed, may be revealed in his time. Okay? For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. That would be the devil and his fallen angels. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. Now, could that be the man-child? Could that be the church? I don't know. And then, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the brightness of the coming of Jesus. Now, we're going to look at other verses that talk about this brightness. So when, when Jesus comes, there's going to be this brightness. You can see that in Luke 17. And that's when the lawless one will be killed by the breath of his mouth, which is the same thing it says in Revelation chapter 13, when you assume from Revelation 1.16 that what comes out of his mouth is a sharp two-edged sword, which we are told kills the first beast. So when is this beast killed? Now many people just assume that this somehow this event occurs in Revelation 19 when the Lord comes riding on a white horse. And that's what gets confusing because when you read 2 Thessalonians 2, you say, well, is this gathering at Revelation 19 when the Lord comes on a white horse? The, the rule of the world. And it gets confusing and you're wondering, well, are we gathered before or after the beast rules? So my question is this, when will the Lord kill the Antichrist? When he returns in glory at the end of the 42 months of beast ruling, let's go to Revelation 19. We're told. And this is a small little clue that has gone unnoticed, in my opinion, that has caused this conclusion. So Revelation 19 speaks about how, behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on this white horse is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now, Revelation 19 is at the end of of the 42 months, people would say it's at the end of the tribulation. But I would say it's at the end of the 42 months of beast ruling the world. And the beast, verse 20, the man of lawlessness, was captured with the false prophet. And these guys deceived those who had received the mark and those who worshipped the image. These two, that would be the beast, the man of lawlessness, are thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns 
with sulfur. So the Lord Jesus, when he comes in Revelation 19, does not kill the Antichrist in Revelation 19. They're captured, they're arrested, and they're thrown alive into the lake of fire. Okay, so let me just read a conclusion here. So since the beast, who is thought to be the man of lawlessness, is alive at the time he is thrown into the lake of fire, the Lord Jesus must have killed him sometime prior to him coming up out of the sea and prior to the events in Revelation 13. Because in Revelation 13, before he rules for 42 months, it makes the reference that the whole world marvels after him because the sword has killed him. So in Revelation 13, we see that the first beast will rule for 42 months. That's three and a half years. We learn that the beast was wounded by the sword and yet lived, healed, where the whole world marveled after him. Therefore, the first beast must have been healed before the 42 months of rule in order for the world to have marveled after him to allow him to, become, allow him to come to power. So the conclusion here, based upon 2 Thessalonians 2, that Jesus kills the man of lawlessness the Antichrist, that sets him up to rule the world. Okay, He kills him when he comes to gather his bride, or the church, you could say. Well, the gathering of the bride, then the church, as it goes. So that's something that people probably have not contemplated, that this event would occur like this. This th being thrown alive into the lake of fire is the clue that tells us when Revelation 13 this killing of the beast with this mortal head wound has occurred. So can we see in Scripture, is there something, some other place where this beast, this man of lawlessness, this head of the house of the wicked is killed? Now if we go back to Revelation 6, let's read it again. And the voice was like thunder. And look, this is the only voice like thunder, by the way. All the other voices aren't like thunder when you read the other seals. Okay. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out to conquer. So who did he conquer? So if this Revelation 6 first seal, 6 verse 1 and 2, is the Antichrist, then who's the second seal? It, to me, I, I can't see the Antichrist literally riding a horse coming from heaven that doesn't make sense to me i can't fathom that so there is a rider coming out of heaven on a horse a literal horse and he has a bow and he comes to conquer so let's continue on let's read my initial summary to this study guys i'll go ahead and read it so you guys can see what i'm talking about so i have been studying habakkuk 3 now for about three or four months in detail. And it's become clear that the Lord will come for his spotless bride at the first seal. This event also described in Luke 17, um, 24 to 31, where the lightning will go from one end of heaven to the other. The same event in 2 Thessalonians 2, which we just talked about. Time will stop as the sun and the moon stand still in the sky. That's Habakkuk 3, 11. And at this time, the Lord will conquer and kill the man of lawlessness in preparation for the miraculous head wound that will cause the whole world to marvel after him. The bride will be taken, saved, that's what it says in Habakkuk 3, and it even says that the anointed will assist the Lord in this event, that the harvest workers will be working alongside of the Lord. Now there are multiple prophetic words that say this, and then 40 days later, those who were left behind from this initial departure those who are refined through this, due to this 40-day time of trial, and we're going to see that in the modern-day prophets I have in this study, uh, they will be raptured, as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And 1 Thessalonians 4.17 is the only place in the Bible, in the New Testament, where it says the left behind. It's a word in there. And so those who are left behind from this initial first seal departure will be taken up, saved, raptured at the end of this. So we see two types of departures. So let's jump to where I have my Habakkuk 3 study. You guys can download this document if you like. So we're going through the seal. So let's go with Habakkuk 3. So what I have, I have Habakkuk 3 here, the whole chapter, and I have, um, I actually took it from various translations, the ESV, God's Word, and the Good News Translation. 
Okay, so if you see something that reads a little different, uh, go to either of these translations for the different verses, and then you can see it. So to me, this is incredible what Habakkuk 3 says. So Habakkuk 3 is a prayer of the prophet Habakkuk that has never been fulfilled. Okay, and I could jump to, let me see, verse, let me see what verse, right here. I could jump to verse 11, okay, and it says, At the flash of your speeding arrows, okay, the gleam, uh, the gleam of your shining spear, the sun and the moon stood still. So we know that the sun and the moon stood still in Joshua chapter 10, like 3,500 years ago or something. So since then, since Habakkuk was written probably about 2,500 years ago, we have had no historical account of the sun and the moon standing still in the sky. So this is future fulfillment. So we can clearly see that Habakkuk 3, unlike the rest of the Christian church who just writes off the Old Testament, we can see that Habakkuk chapter 3 is all future fulfillment. Let's go ahead. So, O oh Lord, I've heard what you have done, and I am... I am filled with awe. So the prophet is writing. He's seen what the Lord has done. And he's filled with awe. He says, now do it again in our times. Which would be a second exodus. Starting at Mount. So the first exodus started at Mount Sinai, right? What about the second exodus? If you go to Psalm 68, you can actually read the beginning of the second exodus. When the Lord shows up on Mount Zion. I'm sorry. Mount Sinai here on earth. Okay, Be merciful even when you are angry. God came from Timon and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now when you read about Timon and Mount Paran, it's essentially Mount, it's the mountains around Mount Sinai. We learn that from Deuteronomy 31 verses 3 through, uh, sorry, 1 through 3. It says, his splendor covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. So somehow God is going to be hanging out on Mount Sinai. And then at some point he's going to depart, God the Father and God the Son, the Holy One. They're going to, talk, they're going to depart from Timon and Mount Paran. They're going to go on a mission. Okay. And then it says, he comes with the brightness of lightning. Okay. Light flashes from his hand and where there is power is hidden. Okay, so if you go to Luke chapter 17, verses 24 to 37, you're going to see that when the days of the Son of Man occur, the Lord is going to light up the sky with the brightness of lightning from one end of heaven to the other. And we have seen this same reference in multiple modern day prophets. Um, I'm not going to get into this right now, you guys. I'll go into that in a minute, but I just wanted to show that to you. Okay. So it's the same thing that's referenced in these modern day prophets. So he comes with the brightness of his lightning. See Luke 17, Psalm 50, the same thing. He sends disease before him and commands death to follow. What does that sound like? He commands disease before him, pestilence, and commands death to follow. That, that sounds exactly like the fourth seal. The fourth seal. What does the fourth seal say? Let's go back up. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm jumping around here a whole lot here. Uh, okay, the fourth seal. Uh, okay, here it is right here. And its rider was named Death, and Hades followed him. Okay, and they were given authority over the fourth of the earth to kill with a sword, with famine and pestilence, and by the wild beasts. That's a reference. So that that third seal, we are, the fourth seal, we are, you know, the fourth horse, we are seeing that played out in Habakkuk 3, right here. That's the fourth seal. Okay. When he stops, this is when the Lord stops, the earth shakes. At his glance, the nations tremble. The, eterni the eternal mountains are shattered. If you look at this, the little uh, eight-year-old Swedish boy's rapture dream, you see that in his dream on that Friday, when everybody's called to the mountain, Mount Sinai, in Egypt, as a little boy saw, Okay, it says that the mountains crumbled. Could that be what the little boy saw? Okay, unfulfilled future prophecy. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea? When you rode, that would be you, Lord. When you rode on your horses, okay, could that be seals 1 through 4? Revelation 6, Zechariah 1, all speak about the Lord riding on horses. On your chariot of salvation, that word in Hebrew is Yeshua. If you read it in Hebrew, you would read, on your chariot of Yeshua. 
See, the Lord's going to come and gather up his folks in these chariots of salvation, which people are going to pile into like a big van, like a big bus, and they're off they go to heaven. If you read Aaron's dreams, the folks show up in heaven on these tevas, which could be these chariots of salvation. Okay, You got ready to use your bow. Bow? Where do we hear about a bow? Remember Revelation 6-2? The rider on a white horse had a bow. Ready to shoot your promised, that's in the Hebrew, ready to shoot your promised arrows. Remember, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out his workers into the harvest, Luke chapter 10. Those promised arrows, those promised harvest workers from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Ready to shoot your arrows. And this is where it gets really interesting. That word arrows in the Hebrew is Strong's 4294. The translators could not bring themselves to put the correct word in there because the correct word is tribe. It should read, ready to shoot out your promised tribe. But that didn't make any sense to the translators. Why would the Lord shoot out a tribe? Because down here in verse 11, he says, at the flash of your speeding arrows, okay? And that's a different word in Hebrew. That's Strong's 2671. Chets, which equals arrows. So verse 11 refers to speeding arrows, okay? Which, which everybody realizes and everybody understands. It is arrows. So when they got up to verse 9, you got ready to use your bow. Okay, a bow, right? With arrows. Ready to shoot out your promised tribe. But the translator said, that doesn't make any sense. We can't use the word tribe in there. It's got to be arrows. So they just put the word arrows in there. But we know better because we study scripture and we know that in Zechariah 9, we get the answer. See, I am, I am revealing a mystery that the translators of the Bible do not, do not know. Let's read Zechariah 9. For I have bent Judah as my bow, and I have made what tribe its arrow? Ephraim. And I will stir up your sons, O Zion. Ephraim are the spiritual 144,000 from Revelation 14. I know that doesn't sit well with people. Revelation 7 is a different group of 144,000. The sons of Zion are the spiritual tribe of Ephraim that are born in a single day from Isaiah 66 verse 7. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrows will go forth like lightning and the Lord God will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. And on that day, the Lord God will save his people as a flock of his people. Save them as a flock of his people. So here we have, we have finally uncovered a mystery that the translators of the Bible couldn't come to because they weren't able to study the rest of the Bible and make any sense of it. Because we know that these arrows, this tribe, this Ephraim, this arrow, is these guys are the harvest workers. I've gone over that many times in my previous videos. This, this Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 8 through 9, reveal to us that there is a rider on a horse. Okay, He's got a bow. And he shoots his arrows. And he comes to do what? Let's see what he does. Oh, the same time this goes on, at the flash of your speeding arrows and the gleam of your shining spear, the sun and the moon stood still. So when the sun stands still in the sky, what does that mean? Does that mean that time stops because the earth stops rotating? And I know I'm going to get lots of comments from our flat earth friends. Okay, I know the earth doesn't rotate. Thank you. I Sure thing. No problem. Thanks for the tip. Okay, the sun and the moon stood still. Okay, because the earth stops rotating. Okay, you marched across the earth in anger. In fury, you trampled the nations. You went out. To save your people, Luke 17, verse 30 and 31, the gathering of the believers, one will be taken, one will be left. Where does it say in Luke 17 where they're going to be taken? Because the, the disciple says, where, Lord? If you look in the original Greek, it says, to the body of believers. But the translators say corpse. <laughs> I don't know why. The Greek says the body of believers. They're taken to the where the body of believers will be gathered. So the Lord's going to, Go out and save his people, and he's going to save them with your anointed ones. This is a um, a translation that comes from I think the God the God's Word translation. 
The other translations don't make any sense when you look at the original Hebrew. So what we see here is we see that the Lord goes out to save his people. Okay, When time stops, and I'll show you multiple prophetic words when that occurs, when the earth stops rotating. Okay, He's going to do that while he's on a horse with no arrows because the arrows were shot out. Revelation chapter 6 verse 1 and 2. And then what does he do? He conquers. It says, You, Lord, crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him from bare from thigh to neck. Guys, I'm going to pause it here until my, my garage door stops. Hold on a second, guys. Sorry about that, guys. So, what you see here in verse 13 is we have the fact that as the Lord saves his people with the anointed helping him, he crushes the head of the house of the wicked, laying him from him bare from thigh to neck, which is the same thing we see in Second Thessalonians 2. And the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth. So right there from Habakkuk 3, we have an expanded commentary to me on Revelation chapter 6, the first seals, the first four seals, where it speaks about these four horses. So there is evidence all the way through Habakkuk chapter 3 that this event is occurring, this fourth seal. And we also see other things about the earth stopping, rotating, which there's multiple prophetic words that speak about. So right here, I'm going to go ahead and highlight that green. Okay, so the clue is the Lord's riding on a horse. Okay, he's got a bow, he shot out his arrows, and he comes to conquer, which is no different from what we see in a shortened version of Revelation chapter 6, the first seal. So where are his arrows? The arrows have been sent out. That tribe been sent out ahead of him, as it says in Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, where the Lord tells us to pray to send out those into the harvest. Okay, so along with the study, you guys can download it. I do have multiple prophetic words that speak about this brightness, okay? So we have a word here that I think this is confusing. This word was given, I think, Mark Chen, and Lisa is the one who copied it. This is, I think, my son is Mark Chen. He says, look up at the skies. Yes, dazzling light, lights of many colors will soon appear and dance across the skies. This is that lightning that you'll see in Luke chapter 17 from one end of heaven to the other. Peace and safety will be uh, declared at this point. Wendy Lee, July 19th, it speaks about this 40 more days. I've talked about this before. You guys can download this, this time of wonders, this stuff in the sky. Um, here's one that speaks about this first sign of radiant colors in the sky, this lightning from one end to the other. And it says here, time will stop for all humanity if the earth stops rotating. You guys can download this. I don't want to go through these. Here's um, uh, Barb at 278 Pike Lake. Time will seem to stand still. You know, if the earth stops rotating, as it says in Habakkuk 3. 40 more days after the rapture. Uh, here's this. this but <clears throat> I'm sorry, guys. But come to know me during the 40 days of chaos following the rapture of my church. So they're, they're, the the departure occurs, and there's 40 more days of chaos, and you see multiple raptures. First, the innocents, the children, and then my bride. The bride comes at the end. They are the harvesting, harvest workers who stay around to bring in the harvest. These are the arrows. Um, I don't think it mentions this one, guys. Look, you guys can download all this. And another one here, I think, that talks about the... Um, look, you guys can download these prophetic words. I'm not going to go through them. So with that, guys, you know, as far as I'm concerned, what I see here is in Revelation chapter 6, this first seal. You know, you might say, well, Jesus is in heaven. How does he break the seal and ride the horse at the same time? See, the heavenly event in chapter 5 where he begins to break the seals that's in heaven in the spirit realm this horse is in the natural and this comes out of heaven guys he's coming to conquer so with that guys I'll let you go you can download this document and uh, with that have a great day and God bless you